And so like this idea of like, all right, so this is the I Ching and all that the I Ching represents. And then you got the tarot, like these are two really, really well established sort of languages. And then the third one, which is a little bit like more contemporary, doesn't have as much uh, like history to it, I would suppose. Like it's a little bit more free, um, but then at the same time, it doesn't have like the, 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 the establishment. And so doing all three of those is, um, is, is like how I like to start the day. And then I do this. This is part of my like my my calendar system. So so this is where I keep track of everything. And what's so cool about it is when you keep track of it, when you start writing down, because I haven't been I haven't done this for more than like six months. So I've been using cards my whole life. Uh, you begin to start to see patterns and you begin to start seeing themes you're like wow like in this last like in this last cycle you know i do everything from new moon to new moon like i don't follow the calendar system like i use the calendar system for convenience sake but but i try to like be grounded in something which is a little bit more objective and then you start to see these themes and you're like wow at the end of this and how i how i see the themes are like you know what are the multiple cards and i see the ones which are picked the the most and then i reflect upon the month or the the lunar cycle based Based upon what popped the most. I'm like, did I see that? Is that how I experienced the month? And it's just a real, like, you know, interesting way to, to bring contemplation and awareness into your life. So you're not just like floating around the whole time and you can begin to see these things. And it just adds this level of, of mystery, this, but in a very, very like tangible way, which you can play with. And it's been very satisfying for me. I, I, I like it a lot. I also use it. And so it's funny you say this. So, okay. Or that we're talking about the I Ching because here's one other thing. So before I go on any show, um, like part of my routine is uh, I will pick a card and I always pick it from the I Ching de deck. I'm like, what is the energy I should bring to this card? Like, that's kind of what, what, what I'll, I'll hold. And um, I haven't done this. Like I, I was a little bit behind the, the clock for um, this call. And so I haven't done that so since we're talking about the easing i'm gonna pick my card and how about this and can we do it this way can you do the same thing we're not going to show each it. other until and we'll see what what comes up okay okay is that fun can we do that yeah it's fun I, I put us on a cold open because like this is too we're already in it and it's awesome oh exactly so we'll just a roll and start but just in case anyone missed it from the titles or whatever you are listening to the Susquehanna's very own Synchro Mystic Sage and personal guide to many for the turning of the age. Michael Wan returning to the show, already having a blast. And we're going to do one of my favorite things, which is draw from the I Ching. All right. I've already picked mine. I've already picked mine. Me I haven't too. looked at it yet, though. I love the anticipation of like, you know, when you pick Mine's the card. So sync. It's, it's a perfect one. And it's like, uh, what, what is it like in quantum physics? They, is it Schrader's cat or Schroeder's cat? I don't know how to pronounce it, but like this idea. like Schrodinger. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't pronounce words, but it's this idea <laughs> where something has already happened, but you don't know, you don't know the, resp you don't know what it is. Like the cards already been picked, like, you know, and, and like this timing between like when you flip over the card and see what it is, but it's already been selected. So like we're in that state right now and I love it. Have you picked yours? I have, I have. I know All exactly right, what uh, you're talking about. There's times when I guess it's like a frequency level where uh, at a certain vibration height or coherence i would get with coherence more than like uppers and lowers but sometimes it becomes like you can just feel this magnetism and there's no way the wrong card could be picked you right just, like it's almost like something is picking it through you it's really cool it's never occurred to me that i could pick the wrong card <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly <laughs> so okay before we flip you before first we flip, for me can you can you define for me what you mean by coherence yeah. Yeah. Um, basically it's kind of like a, a holistic type of sense, like all the parts of self, um, gotcha are in within your awareness and you've, you know, you, you're holding sort of a, a coherent resonance. I, it's like a biofield thing. It's okay. like an instrument that's in tune versus gotcha. one that's a little out is, of tune. Can I use the word synchronize is synchronized, like kind of similar to the idea, like if oh, you're totally. coherence, it's synchronized, like everything's like, like that, is that what you mean? 
Definitely, yeah. I mean, All right, I'm going to start. Like, I heard, like, I, like, how, is definitely, I like, like to define words, like specifically things like this, because we always build into like our, our minds, like these assumptions. And there are a lot of words in particular where I don't think we ever define them. And I don't know if there's necessarily like a, a, a tight definition, but it's always important to me to like, well, let me hear what so, how someone defines that word. So I'm not assuming that I think I know what they mean. So that's. I'm idea. with you on that, man. I, yeah. If All Confucius right. had one thing right, uh, other than some of the many confusions he he laid down on people, it was the idea that if language is, if we can't say we don't all know what we mean, then we can't get done what needs to be done. Essentially, we all, all have right. different definitions for words. It can be a problem. I really like to go back to like old, old dictionaries like Webster's 1828, because that's a trip, too. I mean, is that the first one, 1828? I don't know if it's the first one, but it's one of the earliest of the American language. There's probably earlier than that, but it's got a good online website. And yeah, back then people had very different understandings of a lot of words that we use today. And it blows my mind because you can actually see how certain words have been, you know, there's been like a PR campaign to change everyone's mind about the word. And totally. So can, so can you weird. give me an example of like, a, can, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you tell me one word in specific that has jumped out that like, you're like, wow, I can't believe that's the definition from back then. Yeah, there's a, there's several, but the one that's popping to mind right now is race. Race actually meant more like family rather than ethnicity or what country you were from. Race was like your family. So and it that, had a very, it had like a, like a very positive connotation. Is that correct? Is that what you I would saying? say? It had a positive yeah, connotation. Yeah, because it's your family. It's your family. Because like now, like, you know, it's that, that's a word which is so charged. So even if it's not charged for you as an individual, if you are conscious and, and conscientious of other people, you're like, well, I know that that's, that could be very charged for them. And if you're, I personally, I don't think it's my job to go in and aggravate and, and, and stir up other people. There's enough of life for that. Like, you know, I try to meet people in a way which I want to do the opposite. So so that word race is interesting. And I love and this is the stuff which which gets in my mind are the words with double meanings. Like, you know, when you have multiple meanings that aren't even related, like, well, what's a race like, you know, where you're like competing with someone else and like how that's embedded in the la in the in the meaning as well. Yeah, so think about the rat race, dude. I feel yeah, like exactly, that phrase, that exactly. phrase is mockery because. And especially because in the when I looked up the word rat in the old dictionary, I mean, we all know what a rat is, but part of the definition was describing that it was a type of creature that hangs around places of commerce and business. And I thought that was mind blowing because we have the idea of the rat race. Are they saying that the, uh, you know, the servile class or caste is the the rat family? It's very bizarre. Well, so now you got my brain going. So it's like, and I know we haven't, we haven't flipped the cards yet. So I find this exciting. I love the tension. I love the, like, what's it going to be particularly as we're talking about this? Cause I want to see the cards after this, like, you know, this spontaneous conversation we're having. So it's like, do you think that like right now we, we think of rats, like the word rat has a very negative connotation. It's associated with dirtiness, someone who you can't trust. Uh, you know, the bubonic plague came from the fleas on the rats, like all that sort of stuff. Uh, I wonder, did, did rat have a and different- In 2021, you got to have lab rats in there. The rat race oh, is not about You're being a lab rat. Right. Not so just you got a, the lab rat, you got yeah. all of that. Now I'm not particularly well, well spoken in like, you know, the, the, uh, is it the Chinese calendar where they've got the year of the, this and the year of that, don't they have a year of the rat? Oh yeah. And that's not a negative connotation. Right. At I, all. I mean, there's no reason be. that type of creature should be looked at negatively. It's an important part of the. So what is the, what's the positive connotate? Like when we think about like a rat, like what is it, what is its positive connotation? Do you know that? Uh, not really in the Chinese, you know, that might be something I could just, or Google just in general, quick. just in general, what I would associate kinda, like, with it is it's like, uh, like first of all, tail. you know, it's something that eats stuff, right? <laughs> like it eats stuff that nature needs to have removed. It goes Which, and cleans up, cleans up junk. I could look at it maybe similar to like a vulture. Vultures yes. are seen well, as and disgusting and, and creepy. But the, the funny thing about vultures is they're, their scat is like the most sterile thing. I that's was going to say been. the exact same thing. Like when it you turns think the about most toxic stuff into perfect, sterile, clean fuel material for nature. Well, the, the phrase we like to use out in Pennsylvania is pristine excrement. 
Like that's what they do. And like, you know, and we know that the, the vulture has like historically, like it's, it's held in very high reverence, like, you know, with the symbology of the vulture and what the vulture represents. Like I always imagine it as like, you know, that part of the, of the life cycle where the link happens in the part in the dirtiest part, the part, which most people don't like thinking about. And so you bring up rats and like with trash, but we normally think about that, or this is what my mind goes to is, is like modern garbage. Like, you know, we have all of this that we have a society which creates a lot of garbage. Like there was once a time where there wasn't so much like packaging and stuff. Was there this was there less garbage? Was there not garbage? Did rats like go somewhere else? Like that's a, that's what pops in my mind. Maybe there, maybe maybe someone who's listening is a rat historian and they could they could they could answer these questions for me because I'd be fascinated to know, like, you know, the rat in the I'd like to redefine. I'd like to take back the ownership of the rat symbology. So, OK, are we ready to flip? Yeah. Who's first? Do you want to be first? I never same first. time. I'm always the last. It's, OK. It's part of, OK. Well, I'm, I'm a, if I'm going out I got to the dinner Aries with the whole uh, head here. So oh, like, there we I'm go. First. There we go. If yeah. I'm going out to dinner and like everyone's like, oh, what are you going to order? What are you going to order? I hold my cards close to the chest. And it's mostly because I, I'm undecided, but I want to hear what everyone else does so I can respond to it. So I don't know what that says about my own psychology, but, <laughs> but I definitely want to see yours first. All right. Well, it's one of my favorites. Taming power of the small. Ooh. And Why I've been making a lot favorites? of connections with spidery people lately. I myself have a, a spider on my body. And uh, I find it very interesting to be in the, for me, this is the adaptability part that is really jumping out adaptability and networking as far yeah. as, yeah. as yeah. like these yeah. little yeah. connections that, that add up and add up and add up. That's kind of where I'm at with how I feel about that particular card. Number nine, which is a cool number too. It's air over Yang in terms of elements. Let, Let me, me ask show you it again question up close. before I flip mine. So what? So why is the spider? Why, why does the spider speak to you? Like you know, that's a that's an unusual creature, or it's it's an uncommon creature for people to have like a real resonance with. Like a lot of people, kind of like a rat, that. they would see it as like a pest or or creepy or scary. Right. Well, I would say it's actually as simple as like comic books. <laughs> oh, like Spider Man and like Spider-Man, that sort of that, stuff. That old maxim with great power comes great responsibility has always been one of the like even though it came from comic books, of course there's nothing wrong with where it came from. That that concept is so true. And so I've just always kept that at the forefront of my mind. Anytime I've been entrusted with more power by even just like an audience that now sort of trusts me in the direction I go. I take that very seriously as a responsibility as well. And I think it goes for every, like when you start to wake up to who you really are and the infinite nature within you and the infinite potential that we all have as, as beings, as verbs, uh, that's a lot of responsibility potentially. Like it doesn't have to be like a crushing pressure or anything. It's just like you're, you're getting what you're getting, what you do return to you in a sense. Like, I don't know. That 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 maxim is just one of my favorite life philosophies. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 an important one, and and you know, uh, when you hear, or at least from my perspective, when you hear someone like um, who does have an influence on other people, you know, we all uh, to outside of like maybe the normal one, like you know, you've got an audience, and 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 you know, anytime you have an audience that comes with a responsibility, regardless of the size of the audience, um, to 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 embrace that as a maxim, I think is a really um, you know, healthy indication of 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 you and or anyone else who 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 takes on the responsibility of what 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 they have. So, all right. So I'm going to go flip mine and I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm going to tell you this. There is a, um, there's a card when, whenever I do this, which shows up way more than any other card. Like I, I haven't tracked like the, the, the cards when I, when I go on a show, but I am aware that I, I seem to get the same card all the time. So I, we may get that. I know, card, I know that how card that is with the is Ching, always man. treading. And treading is, I think, kind of similar in flavor to like what you're saying, like the the power of the small. But I always look at that as like uh, what part of the treading is like, you know, uh, uh, being aware of how you're carrying yourself, what I go like, how oh, 
<laughs> you know, try, try to really keep myself a little bit reeled in because I can just go on and on and on. So that that's always a card for me. But but this is the first time I've ever done anything like this on a show. So I'm excited. Let's go see. I'm going to flip it up to the camera. I'm actually going to see it in the camera first or in the screen. So what do we have? Oh, wow. Oh, no way. Great power. We that's got the great trippy, power. Dude. What did I just say? Great power, great responsibility. There we go. And and like there's there's another card, which is which has is to be. Hold on. Everybody out there. Are you as mind blown about that as I am? Because I do the I Ching almost like at least several times a week. And it's pretty much always like that. It always does this type of stuff. Yeah, it does. It does. All right. All right. So this is a perfect balance, right? You know, it's like, you know, the, the two, th those two different extremes, you know, of the small, the great power of the small and the great power just in general. And so that's, this is, I think this is a great way to step in. Must be a powerful conversation that we're initiating here. I would there say, we well, go. what's uh what does great power in terms of the Yijing mean to you personally? Is there anything about like, cause all of these hexagrams can have kind of an array of components for me, adaptability and uh, resourcefulness are kind of the ones that are jumping out for taming power of the small. Well, when, when I, when this card for me uh, actually is, in, in, in how it resonates with inside of me is very similar to what you were just saying about the great power of the small in terms of that mat or no, I guess it was the spider. So I guess it, this is the same sort of, the, uh, of thread, you know, pardon the pun is, is like recognizing, um, recognizing responsibility and, you know, arguably everyone has great power. And, and so this is, bringing an awareness to that great power. And then again, the responsibility that comes along with it. So when I, when I see this card, when I get this card, and I like this card a lot, uh, I like the, the, the image on that card is one of my favorites in the whole deck. I just like, let me see if I can get it more clear or focused right there. It doesn't seem like it wants to oh, get there. Oh, there it is. There's the magic camera. And you know, um, as far as like what we did here, the, the ground was Yang for both cards, the, uh, the beneath element. Right, we just went, right. We just shifted the top trigram, the bottom trigram stayed the same. So that's kind of cool too. So what is, so you sit, you sound much more knowledgeable about the, the, the intricate, intricacies of the easy this is the great thing about cards i don't know i've got all these easy books that i used to like take it real seriously i'm like this is too complex for little mike's mind <laughs> so then what so the cards were like all right this fits in with my with my mind so i don't uh like i'm un, i understand the concept of the hexagrams but i'm not as well spoken so what is the top hexagram on this that is lightning or that's thunder. lightning yes and to me now this could be off because i'm i'm like you this stuff's complicated it's a lifetime study, but I, I go with as much, like I learn about it and, and add things to my memory about that, the, the tri trigrams and all that. But I don't, I don't like ignore intuition, intuition for me, like for me, my interpretation of the eight Chinese elements is very influenced by a Western interpretation of elements, you know? So it's not exactly maybe what a, like a pure I Ching scholar of, bygone days would have taken from the meaning, but we're just using these tools to reflect on what we really think and what we really feel and what we really see and look and understand the uh, inward outward connection in life. And so with me, that particular element, the, uh, the lightning bolt in the I Ching, I see it as kind of like the animating life force energy in the material world. Whereas like the yin and yang forces are sort of transcendental forces that are, right. yeah, more spiritual. But the, uh, I look at that lightning bolt as that cosmic, that cosmic energy that's, you know, hitting the alchemical creation to, uh, to jumpstart the battery, if you will. Yeah. 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 And, and I'm in total, I, I, I approach it very similar to what, like the easing in general as what, what you said. And, you know, I, I embrace even more. So like I was raised in the East, like, you know, that isn't my racial family. And so that's, that's not necessarily something which I know so intimately, like, it's like, everything's going to, if, if, when we get into like contemplation and stuff like that, like there's always going to be a foundation for each person in terms of how they, um, 
ultimately interpret something. And that foundation is what you're born into. Like, you know, that's your second nature. Like you're I was born into a household in, in, in the United States on the East Coast and they spoke English and all that sort of stuff. So, of course, I'm going to go and interpret it that way, like in terms of like the 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 rational interpretations. But but the the underlying thing is like there's something deeper than that. Uh, and that's really what I think what drives me and probably you or anyone else who who this system is not necessarily like, you know, the 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 historical system of at least you in in, in this current incarnation. But that doesn't mean you can't use it. And that also doesn't mean like you're, you're not going to be able to to really understand it from the realm if your foundation was, you know, in the East where you have like uh, 25 generations of family where like, you know, you practice this and that meant something like I I interpret the elements very much in terms of a, a, a Western approach because that's just more more common to me. And I, you know, I don't see it as competition. We'll go back to that word race. Like I think competition is both like a, a really important thing within the human experience, but like, you know, like salt, like too much of it, it becomes very, very destructive. And so finding that, that line, I don't see like the, this East West or like, you know, whatever, however you're going to go your particular way. It's not a competition with something else. It's in competition, maybe a little bit in terms of like, it may push you a little bit harder, but it's not meant to be like, who's going to win. Yeah, totally. I think, I mean, I, the experience that I had the first time I saw an I Ching deck blew my mind so hard. <laughs> I'll try to like keep, I'll keep this into a brief anecdote, but it was definitely a lightning bolt from heaven moment for me in terms of, hey, reality is not so solid like you thought, and you need to pay attention to this. This is a tool. So I was at a, a gathering and I'd been, it was a gathering, like an outdoor camping gathering, and I'd been up the whole night. So I was kind of tired and sleep deprived. I went on a walk with a friend. And um, another guy that we had known, he said he was going to go off sun gazing. And as we were walking and the sun was rising, it was like dawn. We came across this dude that had said he was going to go sun gazing. And we, me and my friend were watching him from a distance. And uh, he was just like in the zone, sun gazing. And he started to turn blue. Like, I don't know if it was his aura or actually his skin was changing colors. But I turned to my friend, Yevgeny, and I was like, hey, does he look blue to you? And he's like, yes, I am wondering what's going on. We watched that. And then the art kind of transformed at the end towards a more orangey gold. And then he broke contact with the sun and it went back to normal. And I was like, that was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. And then we walked back to like the campfire circle and the group there was doing a group I Ching read. And uh, the guy that had been sun gazing came and joined the circle. I'd never seen the I Ching before at this point. I was in my early 20s. And we all took a card and I remember that the guy, it might not have been an I Ching deck actually, now that I think about it, it might've just been like a sort of an Osho themed deck now that I think about it. Cause I don't think this card exists in my deck, but he drew this card that was like transformation or something. And it had a blue, like God looking character on it, like a blue skinned <laughs> being. And I was like, what the hell? I just saw that. And uh, so then that got me interested in cards. And I think then I discovered maybe I Ching when I went to get a deck that I thought, I thought I was getting the deck that I saw in that gathering. And I wound up getting an I Ching deck, but I'm glad I did because it's been one of my go-to tools ever since. My point in telling that story is just like these cards, they really do. If you're, if you're in a state of coherence or synchronicity where you're paying attention, then you're going to notice the just astounding connections, no, no wrong answers, right? It's not even that the, the thing itself is the answer that you're drawing. It's just helping you see the answer within yourself because it's your context of how it makes you feel when you see it. That is the most important part of the message, not like a, a dogma, but with teaching an advantage to like doing a little bit of study or kind of getting at least an understanding of the element symbols or the colors that can give you extra layers of sync to notice. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. More things to play with more, things more things to play with, with. but even so, on its base level, just the art and just like the, uh, the, the very simple basic connotations of each card. Yeah, for this particular powerful. for this particular deck is I mean they they give you so many things to work with. I'm always yeah, it's really accessible in, with this deck. 
I'm sorry. It's really accessible with this deck. Unbel- and it's, uh, you know, we should be these deck salespeople because we love them yeah. so much. So what, so what speaks to me is because I'm so visual, like I just get caught up in, in the, uh, the visual first. And then I go into the words. I don't go into the, 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 the trigrams, the hexagrams. I do look at the symbols, the, the modern version, the person who created the deck. Uh, but, but you get to pick and choose. But what I like so much, cause I use my decks, uh, interchangeably decks, which were not designed to be used. I'll go totally on the visual. And I like to look at the two different decks, which I might have in hand and see how the pictures are complementary and it is completely open in terms of how you want to interpret or at least that's my approach and it a lot that freedom of like trying to find um structure in in that infinite potential of like how you can interpret it is is very very satisfying to me and i've gotten a lot of a lot of like tangible value uh in terms of like direction or at least like all right well let me go and try this let me go see see this this seems to be pointing in this direction and it you know it gives you a foundation like a soft like a a, you know the power the the card you chose like you know this the, the the taming power of the small like you know this small foundation like it's just like how these two cards or act but then i step off of that into like what feels more real which is actual life experience and so it, uh i love these decks and i think i know what you're talking about the there's a there's an osho deck which is a um a base i can't think of what's called i think it might be called zen uh but it's based upon the tarot like it's got like different uh uh, instead of like wands and cups and what have you it's got like four other suits which are somewhat similar the if i recall correctly the person who did the art on that deck also did this deck and if i if i'm correct i believe that 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 artist or that creator they were kind of like under the direction of osho on that deck but this Yijing deck is totally their own and so it does have a different flavor i like the art much much better on this and it's been um you know again i'm a fan of, i'm a big fan of this of this particular uh this particular tool to interact with the uh the mystery of life yeah i think it's so cool that we talked about it uh, before Maybe I shift this into other waters that are that are tangentially related. Do you ever do coins with the I Ching? I began that way. I began. I like in fact, the coins. I made my own. I, made I like my using own. coins for when go- I'm reading for somebody else or for a group. Uh, because, I mean, I, I would do just a draw out of the deck. That works. Like, you can't go wrong. But I feel like when someone is doing the coins and they're new to it and they're, like, coming to you for the session, uh, it sort of makes it feel more monumental in their mind. Like they can't mess up like, oh, right, what card right. do I choose? I don't know. But with the coins, it's just like rolling the dice. Yeah. Well, there's something real with that, like intangible, like it's more tangible. Your kinetic like energy throwing- is going into it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why I made my own coins when, when I first got this deck and, um, I had been, uh, and, and, and I'll take a moment. I want to go back and talk a little bit about like the Dow in, in, in my in my experience but like i made my own coins i try to make everything myself because when you make it yourself like you know you can't really do it wrong you know you're the you're the creator of it you make the rules you get to decide so yeah it was another system but um i took those coins and um i I turned them into something else i think i have one of those coins right now can i show you the coin you want to see it yeah please do let me see i think i have it right here actually uh, that was a bit of a tease because I don't have it. I, I think that's upstairs. I'm not going to run upstairs. I use old coins from China. So they're kind of like thematically appropriate. They have, I took a, they have I got at the a bookstore branch. in my house or my, I got a my town. branch, which was about that size. And I cut slices, like maybe a little bit, maybe about a quarter of an inch, maybe a, a third of an inch thick. And then I covered them in sand. It's a technique which I use with just like sand and wood glue. And I made markings on them and I drilled a hole on it. And those are my coins. And they made the best sound when they would, when they would. Oh yeah. I love the sound of that. But then what I did was I, uh, uh, I stopped, I stopped using the coins. I'm like, all right, this is too much. (laughs) This was too much of a pain for Mike. And I used them 
as a uh, like the the base of pendulums, which I made. So I'd hold it from that coin and that's where the pendulum. So I thought I had that pendulum down here, but it's upstairs somewhere. So I wasn't able to show you, but but the coins I thought were really cool. I love um, that about you, by the way, that I observe all the things that you make yourself, even the banner behind you, you know, just do it, do it yourself. And there's no wrong way to do it. I totally yeah, agree like, with that philosophy. Like, that's, that's the mindset of the artist that lacks from people who believe they're not creative. It's really like a matter of the non-creative thinks they, they don't know what to do. The creative realizes that it's just one step at a time and you just pick something and you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Very much. And, and like, you could go and tie it into your own story. Like, I mean, I think, I think about like how I, how I create. So let me go and see, like, you know, you could see um, like, da, 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 like these collage works, which I made, that's all just like cut paper. If you look closely um, and you could see some on the walls, that was probably when I first started getting into like making stuff. And I started, um, I was, I was like overwhelmed with, with all of these like kind of images. This is like back like 2010, I was overwhelmed with all of these images, which I wanted to go and, and, and take them out of my head and, and make them, you know, make them manifest if you will. But I didn't know how to paint. I didn't know how to paint. And it's like, I don't want to learn how to paint and I don't want to go and study under anyone. And I don't have any friggin' time to do that. I want to start doing this right now. So I'm like, well, what I think I can do is I could probably cut paper and, you know, I've always been kind of artistic, you know, I always like to draw. Um, and so uh, when I start, I came up with my own system. And when you come up with your own system, you get this, you get this freedom, you get this freedom. And, th and this is where I think it comes into each person's psychology is, like you know i grew up in a household like uh uh everything was 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 maybe challenged not necessarily like in a really hard way but like i can remember my 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 table my my the 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 dinner table growing up and i was i have an older sister and and my parents my my father and my mother i was the younger one by four years and anything which you would say at the dinner table would be challenged. Like, you know, you, you can't say anything without like, you know, that being challenged. So I started getting into this, like, you know, the psychology of a uh, when I was, I don't know, like eight, nine, 10, maybe throughout all of high school of like, well, if I'm going to say something, I got to be able to back it up up and i don't think it was necessarily like an enjoyable place because it's like you just want to go and talk you don't need to have like everything you say challenged by your father or your sister or something like that but what it did was it, it got my mind like you know it made me like really think things through but then that being said like you know the negative aspect or the shadow aspect of like you know having a really well-defined argument is like you know i don't want to have to prove my friggin self i don't want to have to go and justify all of these thoughts so when it came to be to 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 making things to creating things i'm like well i'm gonna come up i'm not gonna i'm not gonna listen to anyone else i'm gonna invent my own system and so i'm gonna invent my own system so that i can't be wrong you know, that's like another like psychological like workaround. Like, well, I can't be wrong this way because I invented it. And so regardless of how you get there, you know, I'm just sharing this because this is how I got there. Like the the end result of it is like there's this total freedom. Like, I'm not wrong. I don't have to go and explain this because I invented this system. And then when you free yourself of like maybe some of the 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 the, the shadowy psychology of like, you know, I'm doing this because I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm responding against the the hardship of, of my relationship with my family. Like once you move past that, you're just left with this great gift of like, okay, yeah, I make my own stuff. I don't have, I don't have to justify it. Like this is my own. I understand exactly how to do it. And I always come up against like, well, I don't know what to do next. And so you just like, or I'm not pleased with where it looks what it looks like right now. I'm like, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. And you just sit with it until the next step comes like, well, this is what the next thing I can do. And that's not quite right. But then I, these are my next steps and this is my next step. And then eventually you get to a place 
uh, where you're like, all right, I'm either I don't want to work on this anymore. So it must be done or it gets you to like, this is exactly where it should be. And I'm happy regardless is like, you know, you can sit very, very comfortably with like, this is this is my process and I own it. And I don't have to I don't have there's no there's no one. There's nothing that it can be compared to. You can't say it's wrong or right. I think that's really deep of wisdom for anyone to take in, in terms of really switching from, I mean, this may seem like a stretch, but I I think I can take us there. (laughs) You talk about naming consciousness and the problem with like noun based reality, right? That that the matrix is built on that. And part of nouns and naming is places. And we actually even do that with ideas of what we think we want to create or want to be. We get identified with like this, sort of nebulous, but uh, so also weirdly specific and demanding like final product or final place that we wish that we could be at or want to get to. And uh, it feels so big and so hard to birth that as one thing. You're like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get there. But in a, a verbal, <laughs> a verb-based, action-based, Tao-based existence, it is what you said. It's one step there at a time. It may be a step in the wrong direction and you'll realize they need to step in a different direction, but it's like walking and it's therefore no longer putting you, identifying you with uh, a product that doesn't or a result or a place or a thing that doesn't actually exist at all. And it's putting you, identifying you with what does exist, which is process and or the system. Like for me, I totally relate to what you're saying. When I started doing visual art, I came up with um a process or a system, which was to draw black lines and um, squid like doodle, doodle, however, wants to come out, just do anything and then color that in, like make my own coloring book or with the podcast I have, or with any kind of digital art over time, I've developed a process and that process shifts gradually too, as I get more experienced and want to like improve the process, but it's my system. Like I have templates whenever I first started the podcast. It was like, how do I put this all together? How do I end up with a a polished and good result? But now over time of this defining my own process, now I can take this recording we're doing right now and plug it into a template that I've made, maybe make a few tweaks here and there as necessary and crank out something. So like it improves efficiency. it, It improves my confidence in what I'm doing. And like you said, I can't be wrong, so to speak, because I'm doing it my way and because it, there's it's no yours. one else's rules. So I think that that's, um, yeah, that's very Taoist way to look at right. creativity. I think maybe the only healthy way to look at it. Well, I, I would, I would agree. Can I, can I share a little story with, with like my, my relationship with the Tao or like as an idea, like being introduced, like, oh, the Tao is a thing, like in terms of like a, a philosophy or an approach. So I can remember this very clearly. So I'm a, I grew up, um, I was born in the early seventies. And so I was in elementary school, like in the early eighties. And I can remember this so clearly. Um, there was a a kid who had a t-shirt. I don't know if the, I don't know if this is still around, but there used to be a skateboard brand called town and country. And the symbol of it was a yin yang symbol. Like that was the the skateboard symbol. And so this kid was like, I think I was like probably in third or fourth grade and he was in fifth grade. I remember it was kind of like a tough kid. Like he like kind of intimidated me, but he had this t-shirt on and I didn't know it was like a skateboard brand. Like I know this now, uh, like, you know, in hindsight, I know this, but like it was, it was this symbol of the yin and yang. And it spoke to me as a child, like not like in terms of like a transcendent, it was just like, wow, look at that symbol. That's friggin' awesome. And I, and I thought about that and like, uh, and I knew that was like in my mind and I just continued down, like, you know, just being a regular kid growing up in the most highly controlled um, social experiment of, of city planning of Columbia, Maryland, but that's another topic. So I can remember now when I, um, I was in, I was probably in my late twenties And I was living outside of Washington, D.C. 
And particularly now in hindsight, like I was I was in such the belly of the beast, like the town I grew up in, belly of the beast, like without a doubt. And like, you know, you go you, you it spits you out like, you know, it creates the creations It created like that version of Mike. And I went and, you know, I I started following a, a certain like, you know, this is what my life's going to be. I'm going to go and do this. And these are my values and blah, blah, blah. And it lined up with like exactly what the system wants you to do. And so at that time, I was like, uh, I had a really good job for my age. Like I was like a product manager at like a cutting edge, like technology company. And like, that was a big job at an early time. I found out like later that I was literally my office space was in a building, which, which housed like one of the most important uh, parts of the internet infrastructure may East. But anyway, so I'm, and, and the guy who started the friggin' company was one of the original board members of, um, in QTEL, you know, like, like, like what the hell? And the neighborhood I was living in was the same neighborhood Eric Schmidt of Google grew up in. Like, I'm like, what? like, I look at it in hindsight, I'm like, what the fuck was all this? But, but that's not the point of the story. The point of the story was this at that time in my life, I was, um, a lot of my energy went into understanding personal finance, like personal finance. And I'm not saying like personal finance or person or financial like responsibility is not important, but at that time, I'm like, you know, that was really important to me. And I'm not just talking about like, you know, these are stocks to invest in. I'm talking about the overall management of one's entire financial sort of world. And I was good. Like I really, really studied all that sort of stuff. And I had systems and like I put all of my. So when you think about it this way, I put all of my creative energy, the same energy which I put into everything else now. But it was going through understanding like finance and personal finances as it relates to stability and happiness and shit like that. So that being said, that being said, uh, I can remember there is like in the realm of personal finance, there's certain books. They're like books which are considered. These are the these are like the foundational books of if you want to really understand personal finance, you know, they should be in everyone's library or so forth. And so I wanted to do that the right way. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to read all these books. And there's one book in particular. And I laugh now. I laugh at myself now, uh, like at the journey, because like what the title of this book to me now has a very, very different connotation to what like the title of that book meant to me when I was when I was 29. And so the title of the book was called and this is considered like if anyone listening is like, you know, knows about personal finance or cares about that or like studies that. And again, you know, there comes like a, a fiduciary responsibility. If you live in a world of, of you got to pay bills, you should probably know a thing or two about how to manage money. But nonetheless, the name of the book was this The Richest Man in Babylon. It's called the friggin' richest man in Babylon. And so it was like the simple book. And it's like, these are the five rules of like managing money and so forth. And it was like, you know, it's a personal finance classic. And I was like, I want to read this book. And I went to, I went to Arlington. I was living in Arlington, Virginia. I went to the Arlington library. I'm like, I'm going to rent this book. I'm going to, I'm going to take this book out. I'm going to read this book and I'm going to incorporate these Babylonian concepts of managing gold so that like, you know, for whatever my purpose is. So I, I remember going this, like I, a lot of my memories from that point in my life are gone. They've been wiped. You know, I say that jokingly when I say wiped, I just don't recall them, but I recall this with vivid detail. And so I go upstairs on the second floor and I'm looking for this book and I go to the personal finance section. I can't find the book. I'm looking all around. I'm a little bit disappointed. I'm a little bit disappointed because I can't find that book. But right next to it, like when the whole John Dewey decimal system is where uh, is another personal finance book and it's called The Dow of Money. And at that point, like, I, I don't think I knew what the Dow was like as an idea. Like I wasn't like, I wasn't, I, I wasn't like unexposed to different ideas at the time. And I wasn't like necessarily, yes, as part of the system, but I was always kind of like on the fringe of the system, but it was new to me. And I, I took the book out just because it was where, where the richest man in Babylon should be. And it had that symbol. It had the yin yang on the front. And I had this like immediate, like physiological, 
logical, like ding, like I see you with your with the with the with the tuning fork, which you have. Like I had that tuning fork moment inside, and I don't have that many like recallable experiences when I felt like everything inside tuned up. And I'm like, this is the symbol which I saw when I was a little boy. And like I was like, I gotta get the book. And so the book was still it was a personal finance book, but it was based upon managing money on these Taoist principles. So I'm still like in that world of personal finance, but it introduced the idea of what a Taoist approach in terms of like surrendering to to un, surrendering to the unfolding of life. And it was just doing it through the, through the, uh, um, through the, the theater of money, if you will. But that, that was my, the threshold, which I walked through, which then opened up all of the, you know, the whole idea of the Tao Te Ching and then like the Yi Jing and like everything which that's done. Like I've certainly incorporated that as an idea, which then I approach my own life, like not in a very like structured way, but like, as we talked about with art, like recognizing of a surrendering to, to, uh, to, uh, a, a, a meeting of life and, you know. That's my, that's my story. That's my story. Yeah, it's brilliant. Actually, what, what f- uh, fortune or fate to run into that book where you did might have been right? better than the richest man in Babylon for you to check out. I mean, money and Tao actually do have some commonalities in the sense that they're both conceptualized as flow and current, right? I mean, there's a lot there. And in my personal experience with money, I've always had a relationship with it where, uh, what was needed just showed up, you know, like that's, uh, that's sort of the trust in life thing in, in meeting life. I mean, there is your own responsibility. Obviously you could shoot yourself in the foot, but in times of like dire need, um, I feel like, I feel like there's always a way, you know, you, I've heard you say this, that no matter where you think like matrix thinking is like, there's not enough or I can't do this. And, uh, getting in touch with the greater reality, as you call it, that is realizing that wherever you're at, you have exactly what you need to to move forward. Yeah. Which is the same thing, like what you were talking about with your process. Like once you begin to realize like it's all the same thing, like you're here, you are in your process and it works for you now. And then you just got to really worry about the next step. Um, Our financial system though is, 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 uh, is, is more complex though. Like I, I remember there was a time, I don't know if people still talk about this. This is like maybe like eight or nine years ago. Like the, the, the big thing in the, in the conspiracy world was talking about Occam's razor. Do people still bring up Occam's razor a lot? Do you know what I mean by Occam's razor? When I say that simplest answer is the most likely Right, right, right. Exactly. And so when when conspiracy, when 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 like what we would call conspiracy like this back like 10 years ago, when it was starting to grow and meet mainstream reality, uh, that was typically what was the 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 counterpoint like when someone's like pointing out like well there's this and there's that and like how do you explain this and that and like their answer is like well have you ever heard of Occam's razor you know the simplest answer is this there's not like a you know what you know like a a complex organization of individuals trying to organize stuff I'm not you know it's just you know it's more simple than that but but the problem with using Occam's razor as your um as your 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 uh, logic system is Occam's razor is talking about the natural world. It's talking about how nature works. Like the simplest answer for nature tends to be the most obvious one. It does not hold true to the realm of humankind. Like if you apply the Occam's razor to chess. You know, it's not going to work very well because, you know, your opponent is trying to confuse you and to mislead you. And so, like, you can't use this Occam's razor. So, like, the point of what I'm saying with all this is, like, that is how this financial system in which, uh, you know, the 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 still existent finance uh debt based central banking sort of financial system works and like you know what's what's being moved to in terms of like the next version of financial of financial uh service or not financial services but the financial system which is going to control earth but 
it is it's you can't look at it like with Occam's razor because it was designed from the very beginning it was designed in the very beginning uh, to have a very disempowering, particularly for the people who find themselves underneath or living within the financial system of like to disempower you, because the whole thing is based upon never having enough uh, from the very beginning of the issuing of, of money from like a from a central banking sort of way with a debt based currency is like you can never pay back the debts. So it is a mathematical impossibility. Like it's not meant it's to musical chairs. That's it's how I musical always describe chairs. it. Someone so that is the frequency and the foundation of like, of, of, um, of the system. And it is most clear. And I remember like when I discovered this, like, this I just want to say nature doesn't play musical chairs. Nature no. gives everybody a niche. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it, well, it's a different ball game. It's like, you know, it's, it's a different sort of sort of system. And so the system, and it's, it's most clear, like you're never going to, you're never going to, um, there's a, there's a part of the human experience. And I think that it's been, it's been, um, exasperated into something more than it needs to be. But there's a part of the human experience where we want to have stability. We want to have like solid ground, which we can stand upon because too much unknown can be overwhelming for a different, for a different, um, you know, for, for, for the, for the human going through life. Uh, I personally don't think that's a real possibility because the entire human experience is based upon mystery. Like, you know, you need to go and find that stability within the mystery. Like in the fact, like you ain't going to get the answers, you're going to get some answers, but, but nonetheless, so it's, it's the, the financial system plays upon this idea of like, you want to have stability and you're going to in this, in this culture, like you're going to find your stability through um, having a very, very strong uh, uh, financial foothold. And, and without a doubt, that's what was feeding me or fueling me when I was in my 20s. And I was so interested in in like really understanding financial management. If I were going to break that down, that was like Mike looking for stability in this world. And, and you can do that to like a certain degree, I suppose. But this this statistic always or this fact or whatever you want to call it, like always was so like, you know, it when I first read it, like I couldn't really move off it. I wanted to kind of like avoid it, like not really admit what it was pointing to, but it was showing it was a, a survey. You see this happening all the time in the financial services industry, like, you know, people who manage money for people who've got like high net worth is that they're always surveying them. What's important to them? What's important to them? Where, how much money they have? What are they feeling? And all this sort of stuff. And one of the conclusions of one of these big studies was that regardless of what an individual's net worth was, so like how much money what their value was in, in, in terms of like um, assets is like the more money you had, the more money you wanted. So like people who had like a net worth of a million bucks, they were saying like, you know what, I'm going to finally be comfortable. I can relax when I've got a net worth of 5 million bucks. And they asked people who had like net worths of $10 million. So like, you know what, when I'm at like $60 million, that's when I'm going to be comfortable. And it just keeps going and going. And so the point of all of that, that's like a reflection of our financial system. Like it's always this musical chairs. It's never going to be enough. It's never going to be enough. So, so when I, when I first like, kind of like began to see that both in my own experience, recognizing that's true and seeing like, that seems to be a little bit universal within like, you know, anyone who's trying to find stability through like financial means, um, you know, I, I, I realized the problem with it. So the point of where I'm going with this is, is what you were talking about with like, with, with, with money. And, and so I'm, we're going to use, we're going to be a little bit more precise with language. So, so money means one thing, what, what our financial system is about is about currency and money and currency are not necessarily the same thing. So currency is all of the stuff, which is part of like our financial, our financial world. Currency is just that it's cash flow. If you are actually want to go, if you have to be part of the system, 
which, you know, if you can find yourself in a way where you don't have to be part of the, the system, you know, that's good for you. And there are lots of ways of doing it. But like if you are part of the system or at least partially, you got bills to pay, you got stuff like that. Like the thing is currency. And what is current? It's constant flowing. It is it is cash flow management, money coming in, money coming out. But then being able to create this this like, you know, internal state where that can happen, but where it gets tricky, where the Occam's razor like gets what gets confusing is we have been tied so much emotionally to what we think money represents. They're not being enough. So it becomes very hard to let it flow through you because you want to start to hoard it because you're afraid I'm not going to have enough. Or but people like us that like, know about the musical chairs game think money is evil. And then that puts a barrier between you and the flow bingo. too. big one. Bingo. That's another let like you're fucked no matter what, like, you know, until you can go and like, like, you know, you have to deconstruct within yourself and you're realizing, cause I know I sat with that one for a good five years. I sat that with a very good five years. It's like, this system is so sick and so corrupt. Like this was me. Like, you know, this is Mike's trajectory. Like fully embraced the system and grew up in the beast. You know, I, I, I incorporated all of the beast values. I went out into the beast world and I was like, I'm going to be a good beast boy. And then like, I started like, you know, that started falling apart for me. And then I was like, okay. Da, 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 da. And then I got to this point, like, I was like, I know too much about money. And it's like, I don't want to be part of it at all. And I had a sick relationship with it. My sick relationship it's was a pendulum like, well, swing. Yes, exactly. And then you start to see like how the system works. And it's like, it's, it's literally just, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's easier said than done, but like being able to recognize it's just, it's, it's current. It's literally current. And as this goes to purely, as it's going to purely like current of ones and zeros and like electricity, the way we create electricity is as inverted as like, you know, is, is the, the magic, which is created with, with, um, with 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 the financial system, but all of our current, all of the currency is literally going to be current. It's going to be like ones and zeros. It's going to be electricity, false electricity, not like the electrical universe we live in, and like the the scalar waves in the atmosphere. Like no, we are literally extracting electrons in this in the same way we extract like the minerals to make our the rare materials to make your laptop. Like it's the same sort of like raping of the of the ground we're living in, but nonetheless. Like, like, you know, it's it's all good. It's the same thing. It's electrical current. It's it's the financial current. And if you can be part of it and then like be free of it, like be free. of. And what that means is you don't have that emotional dredging, which is like, I hate this system. And like the system is sick. And does this make me sick because I'm participant? Well, that's when like, you know, we run into these we run into these uh, uh, the problems. But the system was designed that way. Like, oh, you figured it out. Guess what? Now you're fucked by it. Oh, you didn't know about it. And it's unconscious and it's screwing you. You're still fucked by it. You know, it's all of these levels in which we move through it until like, hopefully, you know, at least the way I'm approaching it at this point in my life is like, you know, until I can be completely free of it, and it doesn't matter. Like, you know, at least I can work with it in a way which doesn't have that same degree of, of, um, of of like psychological double binds that's what it is to create double binds yeah man uh with you i actually just did a show with dylan Sacosio about money and i love to listen to that dude talk about money it like like and the passion he has like he's fired i'm not up, necessarily dude. on the same page and again this ain't a competition but sure. i love what he brings to it the well, conversation what, to me what i what i was trying to achieve with that episode we did was about uh well going back to those older definitions of words before things get conflated and confused money wealth and currency are not the same things but those words are used interchangeably by modern people mm -hmm. and money just to like quickly recap that money was supposed to represent physical, tangible things, metals that could not really like, they couldn't go bad. They were storable. Mm -hmm. Protect it. It was a store of value. That was the whole point of money was to be a store of value. Currency is a medium of exchange. Money mm -hmm. is a store of value and wealth is anything physical and tangible that brings you prosperity or happiness. So wealth could be everything from your children to the land you're on, but it's not currency and money is not wealth. Like there's a, well, money can be wealth in the sense that if you had 
you know, tangible metals that could be part of your wealth right. category. But like, there's some blur between these words, but just getting those distinctions is helpful because then you can go, okay, look, I'm not in love with currency. I'm not trying to just accumulate currency. I'm trying to create prosperity in my life and real wealth because real wealth, going back to the the family concept of, of race, like with what we know about the bloodline families, the real racism is that are the, the families that aren't part of those bloodlines are not allowed to create or hold or store generational wealth. And those families do. So like, that's a big aspect of real racism in the world. And that applies to people of all skin right. colors, like that right. we are, are really having a hard time building and creating wealth that can be generational. And even just that word generational, it has two meanings. It yeah. means it's passing forward to future generations, but it also means it generates something. You know what I mean? So those are that, all very important that's words what to get it, into. Like, like uh, I love Dylan's work because of like what he does with words, like, you know, and how he breaks down words uh, and, and that deaf being able to like articulate the subtle differences between like wealth and currency and, and money is so important. And, and you, you said like, it's a little bit, I don't think you said ambiguous, but fuzzy between the two. I don't think that's the case at all. I think you defined it very, very clearly. There is overlap. There is undoubtedly overlap. Like, you know, this can be this and that, but they're not mutually exclusive. I would imagine that would be such a powerful and important, um, an important uh, like visual for people like that, that. That's part of the, you know, I don't want to disempower people by saying this, but it's part of the trauma of growing up in the system is they, they screwed up your understanding of these different ideas. And one of the ways in which like, this is what trauma means. Trauma is something that happens to you, which cannot be processed instantaneously, that there's a lag. And so like physical trauma is like, it takes a while for that bruise to heal the psychological and emotional trauma that takes a little bit longer to process. But like we have trauma as it relates to those three things, because they've been like, so they've been worked with and tweaked with and like this and, 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 and been you weaponized. That's the word they've been weaponized against us. And so, so part of that processing is like understanding what those things mean, those definitions and recognizing the differences. You're absolutely right. Like I just went on like that 10 minute diatribe and I was just talking about currency, but like that was only part of the equation. You can't talk about that without also talking about, well, what is money? And then what is wealth and what is abundance? What is abundance? Like, you know, the, 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 the more, the, uh, I look at it as assets uh, in, uh, in uh, more assets than what you need, you know? Uh, and what are these assets? But like, when we begin to like define the words and that doesn't mean it's the only definition of the words, but it's at least, you know, like beginning with like what you mean by it, you know, this goes to how we began this conversation. It's like, well, let's define what you mean by that, not to compete, not to say you're wrong or right, but at least so we could have a clear conversation. And that's as important, important within one's, uh, you know, talking to another human being as it is to like talking to yourself, because we got all these words, which are just like mumbo jumbled in the back of our head. And we're using them without recognizing like the spells that we're placing upon us. So <laughs> we're about the point where this is like first hour done moving into the Rockfin second hour. Right. All right. But, uh, I wanted to see if I can do like this heroic tangential uh, segue because I feel like I can. <laughs> all right. All right. Wow <laughs> we'll me. Here we wow go. us so, in the audience. So we, uh, we looked at these I Ching cards, number nine and number 34. And I was talking about, I just briefly touched on that. I've been having a lot of like spider sinks lately i think you know these guys do you know the weaving spiders welcome channel mm -mm. i thought maybe you'd been on there either that or they just like reference your work frequently because uh they're into the synchro mystic synchro mythic stuff so anyway those guys have a great channel it's called weaving spiders welcome there's like four hosts and they're really irreverent and funny but also they're talking about like you know some pretty deep things and uh so Anyway, the, one of the things they've been talking about lately is rule 34, which is apparently an internet maxim that anything that could have pornography associated with it exists on the internet. Like every childhood cartoon you've ever heard of, every like everything, it exists with pornography. The reason I bring this up as a sink to try to do this segue is because 
I drew the spider card and they're just talking about rule 34 a bunch last night on their stream. And you drew card number 34. Great power. So where's the pornography? <laughs> so my, <laughs> my question is uh, like the segue here that I'm going for is uh, man, this may be a tough one, but you can I know it. that you follow the space hex space sex you know, all the different things in pop culture that are subtly getting people to think about sex. And I've noticed that along for a long time that there's all this programming to get people to be like having sex on their mind. And I wonder if part of what is being done in terms of a hex is literally just to get people to sort of have uncontrolled and meaningless sexual activity, especially pornography. You And because like, that is a way to sort of drain someone's battery. And then maybe there's an, maybe there's a spiritual component. Maybe there's some sort of like vampiric uh, archon action going on there when the battery is draining, if you will. But it also could just be a way of keeping people uh, away from generational wealth because on a, on a metaphysical level, your sexual energy, your sacral energy, yeah, has a lot to do with what you actually experience in the world, what you bring to the world, what it gets created through you. So that's uh I just kind of want to get you talking about that topic, if you will, like the uh, all, all right. So, so okay, ways now you can see I the see sex the, programming and what you I think see about the it. link which you just made and hats off. So you linked the spider guys from your spider card to 34, which is which is the 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 pornography law. And 34 is also like great power, which is pointing to like what the what the law, the the you know, anything that can have pornography will have pornography on it in the internet. Like real time right, sync analysis. I, I hats off to that. That one, I I love all sorts of pathways which we can go there. Do we want to move that on in the second hour? Do we want to start talking about that right now? This we talked about fun. none of the stuff we were planning on talking about too, which is my favorite. Which is my favorite yeah. way of doing things. I like it when it's off the cuff. This was a lot of fun, chance. Um, and uh, I guess we. When was the last time we spoke? Was it years ago? I think maybe on the. I think maybe it was a 2019 show. 2019. So let's not wait two more years. I agree. I agree. Most wholeheartedly. In fact, I love that last show. It's just that I kind of, I kind of just go with the flow in terms of what comes up. And uh, you actually messaged me about coming back on, which was great, but I won't, I won't wait. We'll get something on the books for, you know, we'll plan something when we're off air here in, in the next couple of days and we'll have it on for later. So fantastic. Cool. Cause yeah, this was, this was amazing. I love how much each Ching came out. I could do that every episode and not be bored of it, you know? And also we want to make sure and give people how the, the info on where to find you, the projects are currently working on and what they might be able to do with you in a one-on-one -on -one sense. All right. Well, thank you for that opportunity. So probably the best place to go would be SusquehannaAlchemy.com. And from there, you can get like links to all of um, like uh, all of the, the free material, like a real easy place to find all the different shows I've been on um, and all of the videos on YouTube. I, I put out probably a video on YouTube maybe once a week. Uh, and that's Susquehanna Alchemy um, as well on, you, on YouTube. I don't know how much longer I'm going to continue to do that. But for the time being, it's still there. Uh, I'm beginning to explore more Rockfin. So like I've got a channel on Rockfin. I just haven't done much with it. Um, so that is coming up and subscribe star is where I put more of the personal stuff. So if you want to go to the subscribe star platform and that's behind a paywall, like you get more, you know, personal stuff and so forth, but for the one-on-one -on -one services, cause at the end of the day, that's my favorite thing is like, I love to talk to people and, uh, I currently, and it, it's always changing the services, which I offer, but currently, um, I, I'm referring to it as Sky Mancy. And I, I, I speak the language of astrology. You know, I guess you'd call me an astrologer, but I, I think of myself more so as an unastrologer. Um, and there are three layers of the Sky Mancy uh, process Sky Mancy one, two, and three. And 
I begin by bringing astrology back to its most objective reality, which doesn't mean there's still not lots of mystery, but this is the most real we can get. And so that then we can start to build up to more and more of the stories tied into astrology. And it's a beautiful process. And the final one is like all about like then how you take this and apply this in different types of like meditative processes. And you can, if it really speaks to you, and if you want to, like, as you said before, like action is, is, is Tao, like uh, to put this into play, not necessarily like, you know, oh, now that I understand my, my, my time date stamp relationship with the environment, which I'm experiencing life within, like, this is how you can work with it internally. And so uh, you can order those sessions or find more about that, like at the website underneath the services stuff. Uh, there are other things which, which, you, which I also offer, like, you know, I think I got like really cool t-shirts and swag. You can find all of that there, but that's where you want to go explore, have fun with that. Um, For everyone who lasted this whole time, you know, I hope that uh, this was, uh, you got something out of it. I always love these conversations with, with other people. You never know where it's going to be. The dynamic between human beings and the conversation always unearth something which can never happen just by one person. So I'm grateful for chance for, for, um, allowing us to have this dynamic, but I'm incredibly grateful for people who witnessed it because without a witness, you know, it ain't a thing. <laughs> Right on. Yeah, I look forward to you doing more on Rockfin just because I'm getting pretty active there now. And I love the fact that someone that was uh, interested in following you or following me for the same price of admission would be getting the premium content from both. I love that. I think yeah. it, it really, for me, alleviates the uh, sort of off feeling about like, well, I just took an hour of someone else's time and put it behind my paywall. but. You know, we we all know the game as content creators. We're all doing what we can do, and yeah, yeah. we all agree before going into things. But it does the, sometimes the give Finn people model, an impression that's wrong uh, in terms of how that works monetizing. The the Rockfin, mo I agree with you completely. Like you know, the Rockfin model re is it feels much more fair because it's not like, you know, someone's competing like, well, you know what, I'm going to go and spend this much money to support the folks who I want to support. And you're not competing amongst it. Like you have access to a whole bunch of different people. So like, you know, one fee and you get all of, uh, uh, you get access to a whole bunch of different creators. And, and, and on a that lot line, of great I, people I, are moving there in great. droves too, creator wise. Mm -hmm. You got Beth Martin's just joined the squad. Um, Lindsay Sharman's been on there for a while. Uh, Rogue Ways. Oh, got, I know Lindsay. I, yeah, Lindsay I know may have been do. one of the first couple podcasts I've been on. Me and I've been on her show at least five or six times. Like Lindsay's yeah, awesome. We ran into each other online not all that long ago and did this crazy. I, she was like the person I went to because I, I went, oh, I found this tr this insane transhumanist tarot card set hidden within this video game, Cyberpunk 2077. It is the weirdest darkest most inverted archetypes i've ever seen and then she just popped up in my inbox and i and i was like you're the one let's do this can you help me with this we need to break this all down and we've oh, been wow. like best buds that ever since that sounds awesome it's, yeah. you know what it's, it's starting to be particularly after you've been doing this for a couple of years like this is really becoming a family like you know it's like wow you know Lindsay. i know like everyone's starting to know everyone so i think that's cool you do telegram at all bro i don't even know what that is Okay, well, it's, you know, another le level of social media to go deep into, but Telegram, we, Lindsay and I have both been really active on there the last couple of weeks since we started ours. And uh, it's like a group chat room and there's also one-to-one -one messaging, but there's no censorship and, you know, I'm in control of the group chat room. And so people that are drawn to it are drawn to my vibe, which means we really don't see trolls or problems there. Awesome. And it's just a fun place to like, we've got a couple of group chats going where it's just hosts of different channels. Like there's one with, with me and the rogue ways and uh, weaving spiders channel. So it's called rogue spider verse. And <laughs> we have just like ho host to host. If you send, if there. you send me a link, uh, I would, I'd love to check that out. Yeah. You can do it on computer or on your dumb phone. So Gotcha. And at your own leisure and pace, but it's a fun way to connect with. All right. Like, I if like you that. really liked it, we could do like a little expansion on what we've talked about with uh, the audience on a voice chat room in Telegram, where essentially they could like ask us questions about what we talked about. There's all kinds of potential in there. Really fun. All right. I think that's it. Uh, we've got like all sorts of good new directions to go to. All right. Well, let's wrap this up or we'll just keep talking all day. Yeah, exactly.
Uh, thanks, man. This was a blast. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Michael as much as I did. Michael Wan, he's like a human wand. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think that you guys should probably be aware that there are two hours of this conversation. If you're already a subscriber on Rockfin or Patreon, you know that. But we did get into even more deep waters in the second, uh, second section of the show. Second section about sex. <laughs> we definitely talked about the sex hex. and. Um, Tried to make sense of all that from a balanced perspective and uh, a reality, non-matrix perspective. And there was more to it, but let me just explain in case you're new here or forgot. The uh, plus extensions, as I call them, the second hour of the podcast, you can catch on Rockfin by being a member there or Patreon by subscribing to me there. So both of those options are going to be linked in the show notes. Either way, you get the uh, archive of plus extension episodes. There are a couple differences between the two, so let me explain that real quick. On Patreon, you pay me directly five bucks a month, and you get everything I've ever done that was extended content going all the way back. So that's a pretty sweet deal. On Rockfin, however, you pay $10 a month, and you get all the premium content from every channel that's on Rockfin, including people that we know and love like David Whitehead. Michael Wan's actually got a rock fin that I think he's going to be getting more into using soon. So watch out for that. Lindsay Sharman, our good friend from Rogue Ways, also on Rockfin. Uh, the uh, Crow Triple Seven, Secrets of Saturn people, and and Rose Triple Seven, they're moving over there. And who else? Beth Martins also setting up shop. We're taking it over. So Rockfin for ten bucks a month. The value of that is going to get higher and higher as more and more awesome content creators start migrating their exclusive stuff over to there. So it's up to you. You can get, oh yeah. And with my stuff, I only have the archives up through 2021. So you don't get the whole archive on Rockfin. However, I'm working on that. I'm adding them as I can here and there. The ones I think feel good to add that day or that week. So, you know, there's two ways to support. You can do both if you want. <laughs> I know that I'm putting a lot into this and I hope that you're enjoying it. I mean, here you are still listening to me talk. Uh, what else did we talk about in the second hour, though? Yes, we did discuss the question of sexuality and more from a male sexuality perspective, like what's up with ejaculation? Is that like detrimental? I wanted to follow up the conversation topic that came out with Santos on that not long ago with talking to Michael about it, because I think we need more perspectives on something such a, a deep, deep question. So. Anyway, it all comes down to how you feel when you're doing anything. So let that guide you. Do you feel like you get more energy or less energy from a behavior? Do you feel more awake and clear or do you feel more tired and wired? <laughs> Sometimes both at the same time. That's always a sign that it's probably a good time to get grounded. So hope you're doing that. Hope you're enjoying the springtime, getting your bare feet on the grass and some dirt between your toes. I know that I'm going to do that real soon after I deal with the stupid taxes thing that's due tomorrow. <laughs> Procrastinating that to get this out to you because I was feeling content stipated. Really wanted, that's my joke when I have a lot of content that needs publishing, content stipated. And I wanted to get that blockage moving. So here we go. And uh, what other things came up in plus? You know, there was a lot. I mean, there was another I Ching card I pulled that had a crazy synchronistic miracle connection to what we had already pulled. So happy that we talked to I Ching in the first hour. I love a good conversation on I Ching and that was one of the best I've ever had. So much fun and the magic of it, right? It's so magical. So we did a little more I Ching. We talked about uh, this, we talked about creativity and art, like really deeply, like art versus artificiality, you know, natural healing arts as a juxtaposed to like, I guess, demonic, sat satanic arts, like, uh, Doctors. <laughs> uh, sorry if you're a doctor. Uh, anyway, I'm just not going to continue talking about that. We also discussed a, a really cool magical device implement artifact tool that Michael built for himself and just the value of your own system, creating your own system. He does that in all kinds of ways. Like I'm really inspired by the way he's built his own calendar. Interesting. I have a lot to learn from that guy. I'm excited to say we'll be talking to him again soon and making him more regular. I think we waited two years between the last time he was on and now. That's my bad. <laughs> totally my bad. 
Ah, uh, you know, sometimes people that are that smart, I'm like intimidated. Like, should I bug them for another show? But after how well he and I just flowed, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't become good friends in terms of collaborators. So there's all that and more in the plus extension. Hope you check it out. You're missing out if you don't, but whatever, you know, the first hour was great too. I do appreciate all the support I'm already getting. Uh, yeah. So if you want us to get into Michael's stuff, support him. Susquehanna, Al Susquehanna Alchemy on YouTube and SusquehannaAlchemy.com. That's hard to spell, I think. <laughs> so check the episode description for links to all that and more, including my Rockfin and Patreon. There's probably more stuff I should talk to you guys about. Oh, you know what? I'm going to throw one more thing out there. I think the I Ching likes me. I think that we have a good relationship, whatever it is. And I'd love to share that with you people out there on a one-on-one -on -one basis. I know that I could do it. I know I'm proficient enough with it for sure. I mean, conversations like today and the, the magic of how it unfolds and all that, hopefully it was a cool demo for you. So anyway, if you want to do a more like in-depth one-on-one session with me and the I Ching, or I guess other types of coaching too, if you like just wanted to approach me about something else, we could maybe work something out. But I want to help people uh, help themselves and I want to get them into that slipstream flow state of synchronicity, which you're always in, but I want you to see it. The I Ching will just really generate the awareness of that from the inward dot to the outward role, alchemical truth. So that's that. I'm going to play us out with a track from my buddy, Wisdom Traders. Awesome. <laughs> Hope you like it. It's called Thick. And we are done for today. I will catch you guys on the flip. Much love and bye-bye. Thanks for being here.